my in it? Can you see me? No. No? Mm -mm. So how far over the other way is it? Because I don't want to walk in front of I just didn't want to lose the screen. There you go, you're in. Now you're out. <laughs> how far, how far? You have about this much of the whiteboard. Very little. You don't have to use the whiteboard at all. If you want to shift it just a touch. That's better. Good angle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nothing worse than the YouTube, watching the YouTube to show me I need to go on a diet because. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even want my head in it. I get my head out of it. It's we didn't see. We did. Did see. Huh? I didn't realize I was bulking until then. <laughs> oh yeah, that's why Angela went bald. That's why Angela was bald. Okay, you I had a beard for twenty some odd years, and then I saw Fifty Shades of Grey in the mirror, and I took it off. <laughs> just, just when it got cool, like, since everybody else was wearing. Beards and they were, I got to get rid of it. But, and then I looked at pictures when it was dark and thick. And that's why I took it off, because it got gray. Okay. All right, everybody ready? Hi. Um, so two weeks ago, we talked about the, the details of a real estate contract. Uh, last week, I put you to sleep with loan documents. And I realized that that was really boring. And I apologize for it, but it's necessary because the documents are a really good way to talk about some of the details of what we're doing. And we're not going to get away from all the documents, but I wanted to get off into a little bit more of real estate law and some of the origins of what we're doing um, and, and where it comes from. So the first thing I want to tell you is that our real estate law in the United States, with the exception of Louisiana, comes from the common law of England. And in England, when a piece of real property was sold, transferred from one party to the other in ancient times, what they actually did was the buyer and the seller would go onto the land, and the seller would pick up a clod of dirt and hand it to the buyer. And this is, was called the passing of season, which is S-E-I-Z-E-M, I believe. Spelling's done. I don't take off for spelling, and besides, I think this could be a multiple choice anyway. Um, but that's how they transfer title. Today, I, I, when I'm trying to liven up uh, a boring residential closing because they're almost as boring as loan documents, what I do is that at some point during the course of that closing, I hand the keys over. And I tell that same story about ancient England and the clod of dirt, and I said, today we've substituted the keys instead of the clod of dirt, and I hand the keys over. It's uh, just an opportunity to liven up otherwise a dry event. So, what I want to talk about next, or first, is the types of ownership of property coming from the common law. They are, they are the types of estates, and I don't know, I'm going to, I'm going to use the uh, slides from the book just for a little bit of a help, because some of the terms are unfamiliar. Again, as I've said to you before, what counts is what's going on in the class. The book is for background. It's good background. It's a lot more detailed than I think you want, but it'll help. So I want to talk about the types of ownership, the estates in land. And that is important because each one of these is some kind of an estate in land. A little different than an interest in land, it's how much of the land you own. Well, you might say to me, how much of the land? Are you talking about an acre? <coughs> or half an acre, or one lot, or two lots, no. This is the quality of ownership that you have in the land, as opposed necessarily to the quantity of ownership that you have. The simplest, the top of the heap, if you will, is fee simple. Fee being the, the ownership of the land. Fee simple means it has no conditions. It's full and absolute. And I found a really nice definition, because again, this, this is the kind of stuff that I haven't read in a long time, so that's why I'm using the book for a crutch on some of this. It's, it's good, basic real estate law. It's important, and it's wonderful. It's refreshing me as well. The definition I found was that fee simple is complete ownership lasting until the end of time. You own the whole, what we used to, what we used to say in law school, the whole bundle of sticks. Everything. You own the right, you own everything. You own the possession. You own 
the ability to sell, you own the ability to encumber. Uh, you, you can do anything you want with it. It's all yours. Fee simple or fee and fee simple, and sometimes as you'll see on the board, fee simple absolute. Fee simple determinable or defeasible is less. You don't see that very often, but it basically means that something can happen that can take away your ownership of the property. It's unusual. So there's two different ways it can, it can um, happen. The less normal way is, you, there could be a deed restriction that says, if this property is ever used for the sale of pornographic material, then the title will automatically revert back to the owner, the, the original seller. You'll almost never see that because nobody's going to finance it. Um, there are different kinds of restrictions and things like that that are in the public records, things, conditions and things we'll get to in a minute, but that, that would be a reverter. Reverters are, are rarely used. The more common thing that we, you will see today is an estate planning device that we're going to talk about, which leads me into the next type of ownership, and that's called a life estate. This is good because this, this chart shows different kinds. Forget the, the non-freehold stuff and the freehold stuff at the bottom. Don't even look at that. The next you see fee simple, fee tail, life estate. A life estate is exactly what it says. I'm giving you this property for your life. It's used for estate planning for, for more than anything else in today's real world. A situation where, you know, in South Florida we have a lot of, lot of second marriages and things like that. A uh, person may own a piece of property, have a second wife, and want the wife to be able to, and by the way, I apologize, I should be gender neutral, which is flowing that way. Uh, <laughs> I just, I'm, try, I'm, just, I'm disclaiming. So, this, the person that owns the property wants the second spouse to be able to enjoy the property for this, his or her lifetime but because the original owner has a family of his own, or her own, I'm giving up on that. It's, it's, it's too cumbersome just for yeah. me. They want, they, want the, they want the property to descend through the bloodline. So what they do is they create a life estate. And the life estate grants to the other person the right to live in the property and, and have all the rights except to sell it for their lifetime. With the life estate comes the burden of paying the taxes, maintaining the property, um, taking care of everything, making all the repairs. If you're talking about all of the rights just for that person's lifetime, when the holder of the life estate dies, it goes away. The estate goes away. And what's important about that, what's interesting about that is, if someone were to put a mortgage on a life estate, or, more commonly, if that person got sued and a judgment attached, and we'll get into that in a, in a later time, but if a judgment or a creditor's claim attached to the life estate, it's only attached to what that person has. And when that person dies, the life estate goes poof, and it's gone. And so whatever was attached has nothing to attach to. So the creditor, whether it's a, a consensual lien like a mortgage or a involuntarily like a judgment, it's gone, it has nothing to attach to. So that's one use of a life estate. Another use of a life estate, again, and it's mostly for estate planning that you see it today, is the person wants to get the property out of their estate. They don't want to have to deal with probate, they don't want to have to go through the expense of going to court to get the property to their heirs, but they still want to retain it. So. They, re they transfer the property to their children, and they retain, the, the parents retain, uh, a life estate to be able to live on the property for the rest of their life. Sometimes it can be a joint life estate, and I'll get into joint interests in a little bit, but sometimes mother and father can, can each hold a life estate, so when one of them passes away, the other one can still stay in the property. Also, if this is used in a situation with a second marriage where the two of them have retained the life estate, the original owner passes away, the remainder interest, which is what follows the life estate, 
goes to his kids and the surviving spouse has a secondary life estate and can stay in the property for her life. I mentioned remainder interest. I shouldn't do that. I should do that um, more clearly. You have the fee simple. The fee simple is the whole bundle. When you retain a life estate, you're carving out from the, the bundle the, the lifetime right. What happens to the rest of it? Well, the, the rest of it goes to a remainder person. Take out a piece, you have a remainder, just like long division. So it, it's whoever gets that remainder becomes the owner of the remainder interest. They own it, but they can't use the property until the life tenant gives it up. Now, for estate planning purposes, again, which is the biggest use, you have a situation, you tell someone, okay, we want you to get the property out of your name, you avoid probate, it's a tax benefit, give it to your kids and keep a life estate. Now they say, what if I change my mind? What happens if, if what happens if, if, I, if I want to sell the property? What happens if I want to move somewhere else? I don't own my house anymore. Is, is this a good idea? Well, they've come up with something that is called a ladybird deed. Um, I, it, I'm not quite sure where the name came from. It may have come from uh, Lady, Bird Lady Bird Johnson, but I don't think so. But you'll see if you. But what this is is this is a determinable or uh, or subject to a condition life estate, and in this in this case, the grantor. The person who creates the life estate and who gives the remainder interest to the children has the right to divest them. That would be a condition subsequent. That means they can take it back. They can decide that I don't want to live here anymore. Even though I gave this away, I gave it away subject to my right to, di to take it back, to divest. To divest means to take your title away. So it sounds like it's from the recipient of the remainder interest, it may sound harsh, but it's a gift anyway, so who cares? But from the from the grantor, the person giving the life estate to themselves and giving the remainder away, it retains the flexibility should they choose to move, uh, sell the property, uh, put a mortgage on the property, without something that most people don't want to do, especially older people with wealth, they don't want to have to go and ask their children for permission. And without this retention of this right, they would have to have a joiner because remember, if you're gonna go buy a, buy a house from someone, you don't wanna buy just their life estate because believe it or not, you could own it for their lifetime. Uh, without getting into too much detail, it's a life estate for autre V, I I believe. So, that's, like I said, some of this stuff belongs in the next building. A life estate for the life of another. So literally, if you bought my life estate from me, your interest would only be valid for as long as I lived. So nobody wants that. Whoever's going to buy your house wants the whole bundle of sticks, and you don't want to have to go back and ask your kids, gee, can I please sell my house? So that's why this conditional life estate exists. Is that legal in Florida? Yeah, that is Florida, yes. Oh, okay. So then, like, say I'm... Uh, Put together an assemblage and there's a little old lady. Could I buy the remainder man interest and grant her a life estate until she passes? Yes, but you can't do anything with the property while she's alive. Right, right. So for development purposes, that wouldn't do you any good. Okay, because you got to wait until she dies. Yeah, wait until she dies. You have no present possessory interest. That's one of the things that you have with your bundle of sticks with a life estate uh, is a present possessory interest. What does that mean? Anybody want to take a guess? You can live there. Just what it says. Break the words down. Present, now, possessory, occupied. Easy, okay? Life is stable. Um, Did you touch on fee tail? I'm just about to. I just was looking back because you don't see fee tail too much. Okay, no, unless you're running a kennel. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I can't help myself. No, okay, so VTEL is an ancient uh, concept, again, going back to our common law in, in very old England, that it, this was a conveyance to 
a male, it was specific back then, to a male, like a son, and to the heirs of his body. So that meant that the only people that could own this property would be the direct lineal descendants of the person that held the fee tail. We don't use anything like that anymore. I mean, it's, it's really old. I'm not sticking to, so like I said, fee simple is everything. I'm not, don't worry about the slides too much. I went over the defeasance. We just talked about the fee tail for a second. Life estate I talked about. Future interests is a little beyond the scope, but basically it's something that's not going to happen until the future. Most of this is actually fairly simplistic, but it would be like the remainder interest, in, in the case I'm talking about, is a future interest. And while we're, while we're there, I might as well talk about vested versus contingent. Uh, again, a little more detail than perhaps necessary for, for what we're trying to do here, at least in my opinion, because it is a little heavy into the legal side of it. Even though it's real estate law, I'm trying to keep it practical and not super technical. Vested versus contingent basically means vested is it's yours, you own it. Contingent means it's your either it's yours and you own it, but I can take it away from you under, if certain things happen, like the enhanced life estate, the ladybird deed, or you only get it if something happens. So, an example, uh, the remainder interest that we talked about. Life estate to mom and dad, remainder to son and daughter. Then it might say, comma, but if son or daughter does not survive the life tenant, then their remainder interest will go to grandchild one, grandchild two, grandchild three. A little unusual to do it into a deed because it's getting more and more stuff in the public records, and if that were vested without the right to take it back, and something happened to the first tier, the, the son or daughter, and the, the grandchildren were under age, you'd have to go through a court proceeding and a guardianship, and it, it's a lot of expense, which is only good for lawyers. Yeah. If there's a lot of planning that goes on, um, the estate planning, a lot of these things and a lot of these devices, because the probate proceeding is long and a little cumbersome and it's expensive, unless you have large estates, you try and avoid it if you possibly can. You don't need this. Rule against, sorry, the rule against perpetuities, i got to talk about for just a second, just because it, it, I'm a little sick and it makes me chuckle. Uh, this, th this has been resolved by statute in the state of Florida, uh, but the rule against perpetuities held that an interest, a, a non-vested interest, the interest must vest, if at all, within 21 years after a life in being. And there were so many permutations of silly things that could happen, and you could never discard. This would be like a situation of saying, I give you the deed to Blackacre, which you can own until the old oak tree falls. <laughs> okay, that, that was always the classic example. But you don't know if the oak tree is going to fall. You don't know when the old oak tree is going to fall. It may not fall within 21 years after everyone involved is alive, okay? And then they would start talking about the fertile octogenarian example. And I, I, honestly, it's been so many years since I w got into this that I don't remember why the fertile octogenarian was important, but it had something to do with a theory that an 80-year-old person could have a child and that would <clears throat> do something to extend the rule against perpetuities. All I will tell you is when I took the bar exam and we we're studying this in a tremendous amount of depth. I was so saturated by the rule against perpetuities that I had to leave the review course because I started to giggle. It just, it was that bad. It was just, there were so many machinations to it that thank God they got rid of it. They didn't get rid of it, they just made it so that a certain number of years, I think it's 360 years in Florida, something like that. Can you give us an example? I did, until the old oak tree falls. Oh, the old, my bad. It's, it's something that you can't determine. The whole thing. Okay, yes? Where does leasehold come into all of this? What? 
Please hold and Funny you should ask is the next thing on my list. So a lease, we, we, most of us think of a lease as being a contract, a piece of paper between a landlord and a tenant. In reality, a leasehold is an interest in land. It's another carve out from the fee simple. So what happened was, and we're really, uh, don't pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, the leasehold <coughs> was a carve out, and what would happen, especially again back to ancient England, is that they, the feudal lord who owned the fee would allow someone to work the land. And they didn't own the land, but they had a right to work the land, mm -hmm. to make money from working the land. They had to pay something to the feudal lord out of what they were making, but the rest was theirs, like a lease. It is a lease, but without a contract document, when the leasehold interest is turned over to the tenant, then 100% of the rights and obligations go to the tenant. It's kind of like a life estate for a term of years. Mm -hmm. And it actually was defined, and is defined, a leasehold is defined as a conveyance for a term of years. Yes? How is that different from a ground lease, or is it different from a ground? ground lease is a creature of contract. Uh, we're, okay. gonna, we're gonna do a whole day on ground lease, on leases, because that happens to be something I do a lot of, and it's really I, I lecture all the time on leases, and I write and such, but yeah, the lease is one of my favorite things because I'm, but we'll see. It's, 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 uh, so the leasehold is the interest, and it literally is a conveyance for the term of years. So all the obligations of taking care of the property, the payment of taxes, all repairs, all maintenance, anything having to do with that property during the term of the leasehold was put onto the tenant. You answer the question, Really, with a pure ground lease, it's the same thing. But the, the ground lease, because the leases today have become creatures of contract, spell everything out. In reality, that's more or less what the original carve out of a leasehold was. At the end of the lease, just like at the end of the um, life estate, the ownership, the possessory rights, the use of the property reverts back to the owner, back to the landlord because they never gave up that ultimate layer of ownership. There's also another carve out from the fee symbol are air rights. Now, maybe you've heard of air rights in different mm -hmm. situations. Uh, anybody here familiar with downtown Hollywood? Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. Very good. Okay, so uh, in downtown Hollywood, on the circle. Yes, the, yeah. actually I live right in a circle. What's in that? New, I live in a right in a circle in a new building. Deep. Okay, so on the southeast <laughs> quadrant of the circle okay. is something called the Hollywood Bread Building. Yes, they just sold it. They are about to break it down to a new developer. They are about to make a new mix use the same way they have mine. They're taking the whole thing down? Yeah. Okay, the so, the, the, so this is, well, yes, but that's... <laughs> The problem with that, and I remember somebody when we when I pulled that first survey out, somebody made a comment about the ugly building in Oakland Park, um, and unfortunately styles of architecture change, and we don't have old buildings in South Florida like if you go up to the northern cities where the things are old, but it's more than that. Where? Miami Beach. But it still only goes back to the Art Deco times of the 1930s. You go up north and you see that when they built buildings there, mm -hmm. the buildings had craftsmanship on the outside. Character is a great word for it. I was somewhere um, in New York not too long ago, and I was just I was looking because you'll see scroll work, you'll see gargoyles. Um, well, they're a little creepy. Yes, yeah, so when they come to life, but that's yeah, they, they, they look very gothic to me. Well, gothic, gothic is a style. Yeah. Go okay, but, but think about it. If you look at those things and you look at the way they are made, mm -hmm. they had someone, if you go back far enough, with tools actually scraping the stone yes. to get all those things to look like that. Yes. Yeah. It, it wasn't just now what they do if they want to put that kind of character on there is they use foam. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's great, and it's much less expensive for construction. Much faster, too. Yes, but you know what happens? If you, have, if you don't put the right coating on it, 
Um, and I had a, a situation like that. It's, no, it's more than that. I, we had a situation where a client was trying to save some money, so they put the foam up and then they painted. They didn't go the intermediate layer of the stucco. And so when the um, Utes went there over the weekend and decided to play, they found that they could take their hand and claw the foam and just take chunks or leave claw marks or whatever they wanted to do. And so by saving the money, they wind up spending even more money. Yep. So yes, they could, you could put some of those scroll things back in, but not like the artisans. Okay, so air rights. So we're talking about the Howard Bread building for a minute. Mm -hmm. What this building has is there is a huge parking garage, yep. mm -hmm. which obviously starts on the ground and goes up five or six stories yes. and stops. And then you see a columns. Small little thing. You see columns, and above the columns is about another 10 story office building mm -hmm. sitting on top. This was divided so that the office building had only the rights, the air rights, above the garage to build above. They didn't have the ground rights, but they had an easement to get to the ground, because otherwise mm -hmm. they have to come in by helicopter. Um, <laughs> So there's an easement that lets them go through the ground ownership, but they were completely separately owned. It's called a vertical subdivision. Nowadays, these air rights, air rights and these kinds of concepts and what they call vertical subdivisions are used primarily for things like mixed-use buildings, mm -hmm. such as there's one going up in downtown Fort Lauderdale that's going to be a hotel in the first eight or ten stories and then condominium 30 stories above it. And so what they do is, there's also vacation places where you'll find hotel condominiums or interval ownership. They already did that. The building is where I live. The so president, part of it. Good, yes, I was going to say that. They already did that. Part of the building where I live, it's, I live in an in a apartment, but first, when it first you get, it's a hotel, then the apartment, then the, um, the, the public's underneath. Oh, I know where you are. Okay, that's And there's, there's a, restaurant yeah, there's a restaurant there yeah. too. Like, it's all. That, so, for company. example, that restaurant is probably a commercial condominium unit. So, what happens is when you chop up a building like that, mm -hmm. you, you can create multiple condominiums, which is a. a, a, a yeah. I don't know if we're going to get to condominiums specifically, but. Basically, a condominium is, where you, is, a, is a method of subdividing a building, mm -hmm. where instead of just being lots and blocks, as we talked about legal descriptions, it's a, a legally authorized method where you're taking the building and making each unit, whether it's a dwelling unit or a commercial unit, a separate parcel of real estate that can be separately owned, and then everybody owns a percentage interest in the common areas. The common areas being the hallways, the walkways, the swimming pool, the whatever public areas. So in these mixed-use buildings, you have the ground floor areas are usually retail. Mm -hmm. um, they could be restaurant, which is a, a form of retail. A portion of it could be reserved for the operation of the hotel. Mm -hmm. For example, the front desk area, mm -hmm. the luggage storage area. Uh, and that's, that's separately maintained and separately owned than the individual units above. And by separating them into different condominiums, you don't have a situation where the interval owners, we, we like to use interval ownership because it's, that the marketing people prefer it. Um, it is timeshare. But the unit owners, or the unit week owners, don't have any interest in the commercial portions of the building like they would in a pure one level, con when I say one level, one scheme condominium where they would own an undivided percentage interest in all the common areas. Any other air rights questions or subdivision type questions that way? Okay, next. So when you have a building like that, under what category does it fall? Like well, mixed use is the best description <laughs> um, in that situation. It could, mean, yes. like all, but it, it, or you could refer to it as a vertical subdivision. Okay. But it's not always 100% vertical. Okay. You know, you don't know because even though it, the more common would be to have the retail, restaurant, whatever on the ground floor and the units above, there could be different layers. Yeah. Uh, so as long as it depends what you're designating in the documents. The same way I, I showed you a uh, that old plat that showed all the. Um, the different lots, even though it was kind of hard to remember that with the handwritten legal description, but there was all the different lots, and I was using the rows and the 
to, to describe lots of blocks. It's the same thing in a declaration of condominium, except it's describing each box. And literally, you have to have a survey of every single floor and every single unit to determine what the definition is. So if you live in a condominium and you live in unit 302, your, lead, your deed will say unit 302 of XYZ condominium according to the declaration of condominium recorded in, and it'll be the book and page of the public records. And that's how your unit is actually defined. You have to go to the condominium documents and look at the, the survey that's contained in the condominium documents, and that will show you the, the exact measurements of the exterior of your unit. I have a question. Sure. So what's the average cost to actually put together because we're looking at this from an investor perspective. What's the cost to actually purchase a, I'm gonna build a building, I wanna make it a condominium, what price range should I look at for the legal documentation to cost? That's a very open-ended question. Okay. Um, it's, 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 okay, it's a difficult question to answer, first of all, because it's, it would be project specific. Um, That's why I said range. Based on attorneys usually like five dollars an hour. So Twenty-five million. Um, you can't go by that. So what, what really happens with a declaration? And I'm going to tell you, it could be from ten to twenty-five thousand. Because I've heard no. about fifty thousand. Okay, but, so, but but there's a, mind there's, mind. A, there's a there's a way here that makes it better for you as a developer. Okay. And that way is make a deal with me. And I don't do this, but I mean with my firm, my partners, we we make a deal with the developer and we say, okay, the cost of the declaration is twenty-five thousand. If you give us the right to do all your closings when you go when you're done, okay? okay. Because you've got to pay somebody to do them. Mm -hmm. And really, what happens if you've ever looked at a condominium sales contract is the contract for purchase and sale charges the buyer uh, like one and a half or one and three quarters percent of the purchase price for the bundle of closing costs. So the developer is netting the purchase price. Some of the things that are normally in, a, in, the, in the contract we looked at normally would be paid by the seller. In, by contract, those costs are being shifted to the buyer. So from a developer's standpoint using that method, they don't care who they're giving the money to. And they use that as an advantage, and we use it as a marketing tool, so that our affiliated title company actually sits down with your buyers and does all the closings for you. And we give you a reduced price on the documents in exchange for that. That's that's how that works. Okay. okay? And in and in the, the freehold estate, I guess if you're doing any type of joint venture with someone else, in terms of a business deal, you would probably want it to be a freehold estate or no? Don't mix apples and oranges. Okay. One the the fee simple estate. Mm -hmm. Lose freehold. freehold that, that's you don't need the freehold, it's a fee simple estate. Uh -huh. That's everything. You need all of that. Mm -hmm. Okay? You need to have that Although you can do a condominium on a leasehold, but that gets very complicated. Don't mix up quality of title with quantity of title. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about quantity very shortly. Okay. Quality of title is the fee simple, the life estate, the leasehold. Quantity of title is do you own a half, do you own a quarter, okay, and how do you own it? And what happens, and, and, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. I want to go through just a few more quality issues, and then we'll move on to that. So, the next thing after air rights, water rights. Why not? So, water rights. Water rights vary depending upon the kind of water. Um, that sounds a little basic, but if you are building a residential subdivision in the middle of Davie, uh, you, t you buy 40 acres of land, and the first thing you need to do is you need to provide for drainage, and you need to provide for fill. Drainage, obviously, is where your rainwater is going to go. Fill is where you're going to put your, pro your, your streets, and you're going to put your house pads. Well, many, many years ago, the developers came up with a very easy solution to combine both of those without costing them too much money. They dig a lake in the middle. They, they literally, well, they dig a hole. Mm -hmm. And from the hole, they get the rock necessary to create the fill. See, the land, most land is covered in something called muck, which is basically soil and mud. But it's not stable enough to build on. It's great for landscaping, but it's not stable enough to build on. So they dig a hole, big hole, 
Now, in doing that, they have to take that 40 acres, and well, they would like to take the 40 acres and turn it into 40 lots, because just by coincidence, in Davie, the zoning is one for an acre and for high-end residential, or actually most residential. So they're going to lose five acres to, the, for a, to have this hole in the middle from which they're going to get the fill. Then they can build houses around the hole, and of course, between the groundwater that comes from underneath and the rainwater that comes from above, it's going to fill up and turn into a lake, and then all those lots around it become more valuable because they're waterfront. All right? That's simple marketing. So, who owns the lake? As of day one, when they dig the hole, the developer owns the whole bundle. After all the houses are sold, does the developer want to keep the whole bundle and keep the lake? No. So there's two different, there's a couple of different things you can do. Sure, the developer could retain it. There's no reason why a developer would ever want to retain the, the rights to the lake because it would require the developer to come back and maintain the lake. So the more common method in, in today's modern world would be to convey the lake to the homeowners association. And by the way, the same concept would, would occur in a typical subdivision for the roads because most interior roads of these subdivisions are private and they're owned by the association. Remember, you're starting off with a privately owned box. And whatever you do in this box is still private. With, with a, unless there's a dedication to the county, which is unusual, would be unusual for this kind of a subdivision. So you convey it to the homeowners association. The homeowners association then is charged with the responsibility of maintaining the lake. And lakes need to be maintained. Uh, they need to be cleaned. They need to be aerated. That's why most of the time you'll go, you'll go to these homeowners associations and you'll see a beautiful fountain. Is it there to help sell the homes? Yes. But that's not the only reason. The fountain is there just like in a fish tank. Fish tanks have bubbly things going on. That's to bring the oxygen back in. And of course, all these lakes that are put fish, either they're placed there or things arrive naturally. And that's what the fountain's doing, it's aerating it. So somebody's got to pay the electricity for the pump. Somebody's got to pay a lake maintenance company to come out and make sure there's not too much algae and do other things like that. If it were not for the private nature of this lake and the being conveyed to the homeowners association, then the alternate rule would be if there were a natural lake and if there were properties around the lake, then each owner of a lot would own riparian rights, water rights, the rights to a portion of the lake. I had a situation uh, many years ago in Hollywood. There was uh, an area in Emerald Hills where there was a lake and there were homes around the perimeter of the lake and they were never owned by the homeowners association. They were never actually dedicated to anyone and in fact the ownership of the lake was held by a developer who then built homes along only one side of the lake. The other two sides were already, the homes already existed. So this developer just built along one street. And when he was done, he conveyed the interest in the lake only to the, let's say, 10 owners down that one street. And he had a surveyor go out and draw a legal description around the perimeter of the lake because this was, it was, everything else was platted by a map, with one exception I'm going to talk about in a second. And he conveyed it. He conveyed interest to like one tenth to each property owner. The problem with this particular transaction was there was one property owner who was not part of the ten lots, who was kind of in the corner. And for whatever reason, this one property had never been included in any of the plats. It was still described as the north 200 feet of the east 200 feet of a quarter, quarter, quarter section. Which meant when you took up a square, where the, the one corner of this square wound up was out in the lake, like in the middle of the lake. Everybody else had a lot, and their lot line stopped at the border to the lake. When the developer conveyed this lake by the circle around the legal description to all these people, he inadvertently conveyed to them a chunk 
He didn't convey, he clouded a chunk of my client's property, which actually caused the sale to fall apart. And we had to, we wound up, we wound up having a meeting because it, we just, what he actually did was we called all the neighbors, the 10 people together, brought them over to my client's house, and I, we said, look, all we want you to do is to sign a deed to these people to their own house. Nothing else. We're not bothering you for anything else. Not one person came forward and signed it. We actually had to file a lawsuit, and one by one they ran to their lawyers, and their lawyers all said, go ahead and do it, we settled the lawsuit. But it was a long and expensive and unnecessary nastiness. The other thing that happened, talking about the, the riparian rights, the people on the other two sides of the lake own platted houses. They had no interest in the lake. And therefore, they were not legally allowed to put a dock, to use the lake, to do anything with the lake. They had no rights. Their rights stopped at their property line because they didn't share the riparian rights to use that lake. So that's a private lake situation. You see things like the Intracoastal Waterway or the Navigable Waterways, there's many more bundles of water rights there, including the rights of the government to have it, it's like a street made of water. They have, it's navigable water, and it's shared by everybody, and even if you were otherwise have some rights beyond the, the dry line of your lot, it's subject to the navigable rights of the government. There are, you can get a license to put a dock. Uh, the state of Florida actually gives licenses on publicly owned waterways to maintain docks. You see it more upstate in, in rural areas where the state owns the lake bottom. And so you would have to get a water lease. And sometimes you will find it in, in uh, major hotels here that are on the intracoastal places like that. Where you, I've worked on this where you have to go to the state to, if you're transferring the property, you have to transfer the rights to have the lease to be in the waterway. Why is that important? Well, you take a hotel down near the port, and you see these mega yachts are docked there. Well, you can't put the mega yachts inside the little marina with the box around it. They have to be out on the intracoastal. But the marina operator doesn't own that. The government owns that. That's part of the intracoastal waterway. It's a federal waterway, just like I-95 is a federal highway. So you have to get a, 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 a lease from the state of Florida in order to be able to use that and put a dock there and dock a boat there. That's for any public water? Any? Government? I live, I live on a pond of water. Okay. And it comes in like this. So you could, now, does the condominium association have to have a lease for the, one, the, the full intracoastal and the finger in? Probably. Let me tell you about the finger, okay? It's funny, I'm glad you brought that up. Let's go back to the plat. And I don't have to show you um, this kind of a plat. But, so let's remember that when, when we record the plat, mm -hmm. I said you start off with an empty box. And you do the, you divide it up as you want it. Streets, lots. Well, if you go to like East Fort Lauderdale, it's streets, lots, and finger canals. And what happened was, those finger canals didn't exist naturally. The developer, original developer of Carl Ridge or whatever, took a box and platted it and dedicated those finger canals the same way you would dedicate a street. So they're dedicated to the public, just like the streets are dedicated to the public. It's the same concept. It's a common it's a water street, is basically mm -hmm. what it is. Yes? So what do we see with like the boat lifts and stuff? Because I looked on my account for a little bit, and like there's like the zoning where... Okay, so is the boat lift on, on the land, or is it in the water? It's in the water. Right? Same as the dock. Okay. Yeah, I mean, <coughs> there may be, on the finger canals and such, there may be ordinances or maybe common usage that the city says you can maintain a dock, as long as, you know, by zoning code, as long as you don't go out more than... 25 feet. Because if you go out too far, you close the canal down and people can't, um, can't use it. Because it's, it's, a, it's a thoroughfare, basically, a wet thoroughfare. So that's usually what happens on those kinds of canals. Obviously, if the lift, the old-fashioned the old kind of lifts were cranks called davits that you'd attach the boat and bring the boat up onto the land. So that was okay. But you still had your dock. 
you know, you still have, most people had a dock that protruded out into the waterway, and that's usually by zoning code that you're allowed to do that to a point. So okay? Legally, who would be responsible for the maintenance, like dredging and stuff like that? Of the whole canal? Yeah, like, I know in Pompano Beach, because I've sold houses over there, in Pompano Beach, Pompano Beach does the, um, excuse me, Lighthouse Point. Lighthouse Point does the dredging. No, Pompano does Beach mean? does the dredging. Lighthouse Point does not. Dredging of what? So when the, the end of the canal okay. fills up with gook, oh, and someone comes you the, in. You mean the dead end? Yeah, okay. when one end is dead and the water just pushes all this stuff there, yet someone has to come and dig it out and it costs a lot of money. Well, it depends. I mean, that's also, you know, it could be, it could be done by the city and part of the tax bill. It could be done by the city and it could be a special. They're including in the tax. Okay. Well, it could, it could be part of the tax bill for the waterfront lots. It could be part of the tax, a special assessment in the tax bill for those subdivisions. I don't know. I haven't, I actually haven't looked to see. You look at, I'll have to talk about tax bills and things and the different components of a tax bill. I'll make a note to, to do that. Trust me, it's not easy to fill four hours of a, a clip, so. But you, said, you heard my comments earlier. Yeah, you were here. yeah. <laughs> Someone said to me, well, How, how's the class going? Is it, is it going okay? And I said, well, it's kind of like a colonoscopy. The class is fine. It's the prep that's really rough. <laughs> so, okay. So you mentioned, you mentioned dredging the dead end of the canal. Mm -hmm. But there's another thing to think about. I, I never realized this until somebody told me they were having a problem. And that is the other end of the canal. So talk about, you know where the Intracoastal runs along Fort Lauderdale, and there's finger canals. Well, as water goes by, it's moving sand and silt and things like that. Water picks it up, and the boats are going by, and they're causing the, the water to go to the side. What was happening, what does happen, is that the silt, the sand, goes this way, and accumulates, goes to the lowest point, and the lowest point at that point was the end, the, the open end of the finger canals. Mm -hmm. And it turned into a speed bump. Mm -hmm. So if you had a boat with a deep hull, people were having a, or, or you know, where your motors are, you, people were having a problem and they actually had to pay somebody to come out and clean it, dredge it. Mm -hmm. But that's another problem there. And again, who does it and at what expense, I'm not quite sure. Okay, water rights. Mineral rights. Um, I don't have this one. I don't have an example to show easily. But what happens with mineral rights are we take our we'll go back to our fee simple. where you have your whole bundle of sticks. More common in places where there is mining going on, uh, which includes parts of the state of Florida or the middle of the state where there's phosphate mines, places where there's oil. You convey the property. You convey what, most of the fee simple property but you retain the rights to the minerals. Minerals can be, and I, I can probably find you a fast example with, in the abstract, but minerals could be oil, phosphate, um, in, the, in the other parts of the country, gold, silver, anything like that. So, I know you're smiling because you're from the, the middle of the country somewhere. And we made a lot of money out of it. Okay, so, so <laughs> right. mineral rights were good to us. They're very good because what happens is these companies back in the day, and including, I will tell you, the state of Florida, which we'll talk about in the title clouds and things, um, they reserve the mineral rights. You can have everything else, but you can't have what's under the ground. You're gonna, you want a house? You want to build a condo? You want to build an office building? That's fine. But by the way, if jet clamping digs and out comes the oil, the oil belongs to me. I'm retaining that right. That wouldn't be so bad, except in almost every case, when they reserve it, they reserve the right of entry and exploration. That's a problem. Because that gives the holder of the mineral rights the right to come on your property and dig. Now, Florida has a statute that says, because this, this used to be a title issue, we do, I don't I mean, dealing with it all the time. But this was a title issue you would deal with in a lot of the old subdivisions. Out in the, back in the 40s, when people weren't paying their real estate taxes, the land boom had died, things were going wrong, the government would take a lot of the property. The state of Florida would take back property for the failure to pay real estate taxes. 
when the state would convey the property back out again so they could get the money, they'd sell the property, they would retain the mineral rights. Mm -hmm. So now, you, you get it, you're looking through the chain of title, which we'll talk about today, and you'll find that there's a mineral reservation. And how would they own. know? How would they know? Mm -hmm. How would who know? Like, the government will know that you have something, I mean, I guess oil is obvious. Oh, they don't, they, don't, they don't care. They don't know or not know. They just retain the right to find out. So, in order to reduce the problem a little bit, the state passed a statute that says if it's less than five, if the property is less than five acres, then the right of entry and exploration goes away, because it's more, more likely in a developed area where you're not going to be mining for the stuff. That's not the case upstate. Is this? Did you say the state? State of Florida. In, in that case, yes. Reserved the mineral right. Yes, and. I'll tell you about the private rights later when we get to title issues and curing title and things like that. That's crazy. Okay? Okay? I can show it. I'll show it to you. I've I brought, you know, I like to bring props. This one, this one I couldn't, uh, I couldn't scan or email or anything like that, but this is, this is for a little later on. Okay. Easements. That's it. Another, another property right is an easement. I know I touched on them briefly in some of our other discussions. An easement is the right to go across the property of another. Um, it's, they exist for a variety of reasons. Uh, usually it's because I sold you that back quadrant of the, of the property and there's no road, there's nothing else. So you need, for me, the right to get from that back quadrant, since I own the rest of the room, to get to the door. So we talked about that. Uh, there are different kinds of easements. There are easements that are very simple like that, a road easement. There are easements for utilities. You see that all the time in development. Some easements are created by a specific document called an easement. Others are created on the plats. It's still an easement, but it's when you record the plat to the subdivision, you record the streets, you record where the utility lines go, and if you were in Davy in a certain part of, part of time, you we had a bridal easement. It was never used. That's not for uh, weddings. That's for the horses. So. They, they actually had a 10-foot strip along the side of the driveway, which you didn't, you didn't see it, but on the plat, it was recorded as a 10-foot strip, and it said bridal easement, so you could bring your horses in and out. I moved to Davie, when I originally moved to Davie in 1996, and when I was first commuting from Hollywood and then Fort Lauderdale, um, almost three-quarters of the time driving home, I'd see people on horseback. It's not so common anymore. So it was, it was a big part of Davie. So, there's easements by necessity, there's easements by prescription. Easement by prescription is when, either through permission or otherwise, you've been allowed to use a, an area to cross, and you've used it for years and years. Uh, there was never a document, I'm dealing with one right now in a commercial development, and there's an easement that was supposed to be for those people over there, to get to a street, to get out in a more convenient way, but there's two businesses over here that have been using the same easement for years and years because the front of their business is on a major highway with a median strip, and if anybody wants to go in that direction, they use the easement, they go to the next cross street where there's a traffic light, and head back east. So, but by the, the problem is, that it's been permitted for so many years that they've acquired it. Question, just hand up. Okay. Easement. So there's easements by prescription, uh, necessity, or an express easement. Less than an easement is a license. A license is a limited right, an agreement that I don't have this in this part of the um, slideshow. Do I have it here? No. Okay. Um, a license is a much more limited right. For example, um, granting a license to use my tract of land for the Broward County Fair for one month. It's not an easement. It's not a lease. It's just a right of use for a limited period of time. Um, it's kind of like an easement because it lets you go onto the land and use the land but it's not permanent in nature, and it's much less formal. 
An easement is a much more formal document. It's always recorded. It's actually an interest in land. A license is not. It's more of a permissive nature, something um, temporary and less formal. Okay? So those are the qualities of ownership. Now, let me make this go away. Give me one second. I'm not sure. piece of property together. And they would acquire properties A and B. They own it as what's called tenants in common. Tenants in common is the simplest way for two people to own a piece of property. They each own, in my example, an undivided one-half interest. You can have as many tenants in common as you want. Um, and you can split up the percentages of ownership. Each person can do what they want with their half, absent some contract between them. If somebody dies, it goes to their heirs. Um, they each have all the rights of the property, fee simple, same quality of property. They just each own half of it. Okay? That's tenants in common. Sometimes you have family members or other situations where you want to own property together but you want to have a special provision. And the special provision would be, if, something, if, if one of them dies, then the other person automatically becomes the owner of the whole interest. That's called joint tenants with rights of survivorship. You must create that expressly. That you can't like think, it, it cannot be, Anything but those words, or substantially those words, there's always been a lot of litigation about that because if people make a mistake in not using the words joint tenants with right of survivorship, invariably somebody passes away and somebody else files a lawsuit saying, no, that's not what was meant. If that has to be 50-50, or equal shares if there's more than, than two, and one of the parties can sever it, can, can undo the survivorship rights simply by conveying the property away. Question. Um, so what happens when you buy the property under an LLC? Do you Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, right now we're dealing with humans. Right. Okay, we'll get to entities in a minute. Okay. okay? So joint tenant, yes? So one party can, uh, can opt to lead a survivorship? They can make the survivorship go away. And they, they can convert it to tenants in common. So you don't need all parties? No. Any one person can, any one of them can do it. How would they do that? Just the deed. Just file a new deed yep. for their share. Because they can't get rid of you off of it. They can't get rid of you. They can get rid of your rights to inherit. Not, it, that's not inheriting. Uh, it's your a, right it's, to be the survivor. Survivor. It's actually called acquiring by purchase as opposed to acquiring by inheritance. It's, it's a little bit, it's, a, it's different. Just like the life estate. If you have joint tenants with right of survivorship, when one person dies, the other one, their interest goes poof. Nothing, you know, it doesn't, if you, it just goes away. It goes, automatically goes to the other person. Mm -hmm. Okay? No, if you, okay, I, my question is about how <coughs> can one person sever those rights? Deed. They can do a deed to a third party. They can actually do a deed to themselves. You can do it, let's say, let, if you and I have owned property as joint tenants with right of survivorship, and you decide that you want your share to go to your kids and not to me, mm -hmm. you can issue a deed to yourself and in the body of the deed say, I'm issuing this deed to myself to sever the joint tenancy. 
But that would also have to be recorded, right? Would, oh, yes. That yes. That's, that's different. That's a whole different situation. Okay. Okay? There is a special type of joint tenancy between married persons. What? Correct. Good. Tenancy by the entireties. Tenancy by the entireties is only available between married persons. Not any other, I mean, that's just a flat rule. And it, rather than having a 50-50 ownership, like the joint tenants with right of survivorship, the unity, the, the married unity, owns the whole. the whole. So it is, they are considered to be one person for the purpose of a tenancy by the entirety. And the reason this is very important has to do with creditors. Because if you own a piece of property, and I sue you and get a judgment against you, and I properly record the judgment, it is a lien upon your property, which I can execute upon. I can foreclose, and we'll talk about defaults and remedies in a couple of weeks, but I can actually go and file a lawsuit and foreclose my lien on your property and take it away from you, just like taking away if you don't pay your mortgage. With tenancy by the entireties, a judgment against one of the spouses will not attach to the property. Only a judgment against both spouses would attach to the property because one spouse doesn't own the property. They don't own a half of the property. They don't, they own the, only the marital unit, the, the husband and wife, or husband and husband, or wife and wife, doesn't matter, own the whole thing, and therefore no judgments. Okay? The only exception is if there's a divorce. A divorce turns the, the joint tenants with right of, uh, sorry, the tenants by the entireties into tenants in common. As soon as that decree is final. So that presents a problem because if one spouse has a hovering judgment out there against them, and this isn't, and if that happens and you're doing a, a marital settlement and the, one, the spouse without the judgment is going to get the property, or either as an award or by a purchase agreement, you want to do that conveyance before the marriage is dissolved because at that point the judgment doesn't attach. If the judgment if the, the judgment of dissolution of marriage is executed, that judgment is also automatically going to attach to the interest of the spouse that it's hovering against, and then if it were, there were a conveyance and settlement, it would be subject to the judgment. Confuse everybody? No? Okay? All right. Next, partnership. Partnership is when two or more persons own a piece of property together, for a common business, actually it's for profit, the definition is two or more persons getting together for profit. But a partnership is usually, it is always subject to a partnership agreement, unless you're, I mean you can have, you can have in Florida an oral general partnership. A general partnership is simply a, a business venture between two persons or more, two or more persons for profit um, to own something together and to operate that something for as a business. The reason it's important to remember that a general partnership can be oral as opposed to any other kind of entity or agreement is for lottery tickets. Well, this may sound a little far-fetched, I've actually done this before, where if you and your friends go or you and your family go and decide you're going to buy a lottery ticket, you know, and every week somebody goes to 7-Eleven and gets that lottery ticket and you're holding that lottery ticket now, you get really lucky and you get a $15 million win, and you're holding that ticket in your hand. If you go and claim that ticket yourself, you're going to have to pay the income tax on the entire amount yourself. And when you give the money to your, the other people that are in your group, you're going to have gift tax issues, and it's going to be a double hit. So, you could have an oral general partnership that says, we are the partners of XYZ Lottery Fund, and we're designating our managing partner to buy the ticket with our money. And, you know, so what happens if you, so if you do that and you win, call me. I, I, I documentation <laughs> fix that. What we did was, we, we, I mean, literally, and it's really, it's because if you have five, let's say you have five people that own, 
or you have a family and you're going to split it up amongst the family, then the income tax gets divided five ways. You might have young people who are not making a lot of money, who are in a much lower tax bracket. You don't have a problem with moving money, so $15 million minus the taxes and all. If you start transferring, you're going to run into gift tax problems. You don't have that. So you document the partnership because it's allowed to be oral. Then you do an affidavit of partnership after the fact, and you can establish it, and then you can convert it later on to another form. Most of the time, a general partnership is going to have a written partnership agreement. The written partnership agreement is going to provide that we are the partners, we own this piece of property, um, we've contributed X number of dollars each, and it's going to restrict what the manager can do, the, the managing partner or any of the general partners can do uh, with the property without the consent of the others. One of the major problems with a general partnership is that any one general partner has the authority to bind the partnership, which means absent someone knowing that there was a restriction, that any one partner can go into the bank and borrow money. It will never happen in the bank for real because they're going to look for all kinds of authority and ask for partnership documents. But they can contract uh, with somebody to bring rock onto the property or do work to the property, things like that. They have the legal authority, any one general partner. They also have, each has unlimited liability because they're all general partners. They're just co-owners. So if something goes wrong on the property, either someone hurts themselves or something isn't paid for, any of those partners can be responsible. And of course, what often happens in real estate development and these kinds of business things is you have the guy with all the knowledge teaming up with the guy with all the money. And so you want to, the guy with all the money has to be careful that the guy with all the knowledge, supposedly, doesn't do something wrong. General partnerships are not usually used amongst individuals because of this unlimited liability issue. Have you ever seen someone get into a general partnership and survive the tail of the tail? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. They're oh, all the time. Because you have people that have been around for 50, 60 years. They don't care. They've been doing it, you know. They have partnerships with their, you know, their, their sister and brother-in-law, and they all own this warehouse together. Yeah, no one right now like that. Okay. They just, you just have all the people. And, oh, by the way, and also, one of the quirks about a partnership is you can hold title to the real estate either in the name of the partnership or in the name of the partners. If you do it in the name of the partnership and there is, it's not a, a filed legal entity, which is optional with a general partnership, you have, to do, you have to have a fictitious name filing to show, because if you're doing business as the uh, College Avenue Partnership, and that's all it is, the public has to know who that is and who they're dealing with. Of course, if you're going to do any kinds of transaction, you're going to have to prove at the time you're conveying title who the people are and what their authority is. For a bit more protection, a lot more formality, and still used a while, but quite a bit, is a limited partnership. A limited partnership has to be filed with the state of Florida. Um, I mean, this obviously applies in other states as well, but I'm dealing with Florida for you. Limited partnership has limited partners and, a gen and one or more general partner. The general partner has the authority to buy the partnership. The general partner also has the unlimited liability. The limited partners are basically investors. They are the ones who put money up, but they have no vote, except perhaps in very, very limited um, instances as defined by the limited partnership agreement. For example, they might require a vote, bless you, might require a vote of the limited partners to sell or to take out a mortgage or do stuff like that to the property. That would be a common, t way, a common restriction, but that would flow through to any kind of an entity. The limited partnership, the limited partners are not allowed to participate in the day-to-day -day management of the property. If a limited partner participates in the management of the property and, and gets too involved, they can convert themselves inadvertently to be a general partner with unlimited liability, which is a very bad thing. Usually when you see a limited partnership, you'll see that the general partner is some kind of an entity, um, just for the protection of the people involved. Next, a corporation. Corporation can own a piece of property. Corporation 
real simple. You form partners of, of the corporation. It's, kind of, it's an old form uh, of, of doing business. And you have officers, a board of directors, you have shareholders. Uh, the authority stems from whatever you, you have your officers who can sign. If you will, the senior officers would be the president, vice president, uh, secretary. Then there could be other assistant secretaries and things. Most business entities you see, not necessarily in real estate, you'll find corporations. Not much to it. Real estate is usually an S corp, right? You're getting to tax. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to tell you the reason. The reason for lack of favor of using a corporation in real estate is the taxation issue. In, in any kind of in, in a regular corporation, the corporation itself is taxed at the, as, a, as an entity. If the corporation distributes profits to the shareholders, the shareholders are taxed on their investment. So that's a double tax. If you're dealing with uh, Apple, there are so many shareholders, it just has to be that way. I mean, that's just how it is. If you deal with any large entity, it's going to be a, what's called a C corporation, C being corporation, it's taxed that way. The alternative, which was alluded to, is called an S corporation. An S corporation is a type of corporation that is taxed as a partnership. There are limitations on an S corporation. You can only have certain types of shareholders. You can't have other entities as shareholders. They have to either be individuals or trusts or there's certain restrictions. There can only be so many of them. I believe it's 35, unless they've increased it recently. And your loss passed through in an S corporation is limited to your basis. So those are reasons why S corporations are not as popular. They used to be very popular because Florida didn't recognize the limited liability company from a tax standpoint. The limited liability company is now probably the most popular entity for the ownership of real estate because it is a flow-through entity in most cases. All the tax attributes flow through to the owners. Um, you can have a multi, typically a multi-member limited liability company where you appoint one or more managers or you can authorize the members to manage themselves in a smaller organization that sometimes they do that. Um, other companies can be members of the limited liability company. So uh, you're, if, if I have an investment LLC and I want my investment LLC to invest in your developing LLC, I can do that. Whereas in an S corporation, I could not do it that way. It's not a recognized permissible shareholder. Um, if I, a single member LLC is disregarded or may be disregarded as an election for federal tax purposes, and that gives all kinds of flexibility for things. So it's just, it's, it's because it's just one person, they use it as a pure tax, a, a pure flow through, and you don't even have to file a tax return at the LLC level. But, like a corporation and a limited partnership, the limited liability company gives you protection from liability for judgments and things like that. So it's very popular to be used for real estate. Finally, there are trusts. Trusts are usually used for estate planning purposes. It's where a person creates a trust, they hold the title, they move the property to themselves as trustee under a trust agreement. Trust agreement is like a contract. Uh, it's often used as a substitute for a will, so that if the trust provides, and once the property is in the trust, when somebody dies, it goes according to the document to whoever the heirs are without having to go through a probate proceeding. In addition, the trust can provide that if the person who created it while acting as trustee became incapacitated, then someone else could step in as a successor trustee and operate the trust assets for the benefit of the beneficiary. And there are different kinds of beneficiaries. Going back to the life estate, you have the income beneficiary during that person's life. It's really almost like a life estate and personal property. And then the trust will, will say what happens when that person dies, who gets it. And it will also, just like a will would say, if the first tier of beneficiary doesn't survive the seller of the trust, it goes down to the next tier, just like a will would. You can hold title in a trust. Uh, title is actually not held in the trust itself. This is a little different than all these other entities I was talking about. 
because a trust is not a legal entity that is capable of holding title. Let me repeat that. A trust is not a legal entity that is capable of holding title. Title is held by the trustee, the person designated by the trust, and they, it is held under the terms and conditions of the trust. Does the deed have the trust and then the trust? The deed should read to John Smith, comma, as trustee of the John Smith Trust dated January 25th, 2019. That's how it's supposed to read. Then what happens from a title standpoint is you can add language to that deed saying that the trust gives to the trustee the powers to operate the property, sell the property, mortgage the property, convey the property, which is a way to, when you go to sell it, keep people from having to examine the trust document in great detail. Now, is that, and I know that's a tax question, but I don't, it just popped in my head. Is that treated as like a company would be treated in terms of taxing, or is it taxed individually? Like if they were to sell. If it's a basic trust, yes. if it's what we call a grantor trust, a typical trust where I create a trust for my own benefit. Right. While I'm alive, I have all the income. I'm the trustee. I can do whatever I want. When I die, it goes to my kids, or goes to my wife, and then to my kids. That's called a grantor trust. That is a pass through. That is not a separate tax entity. If I were to create an irrevocable trust, where I'm actually getting rid of everything now, or a complex trust is created like I'm creating a trust for the benefit of somebody else, which is done all the time, sometimes that trust is a separate tax paying entity. They get deductions for distributions okay. at the trust level, and the income gets picked up by the beneficiary. That's a complex trust. Um, what, what's probate? Oh, sure. Probate is a court proceeding that determines what happens when somebody dies, determines what happens to their property. The, the, the court hmm? does several things in a probate proceeding. Number one, they receive the will, if, in a test state statement, a statement there is a will. They receive the will and they authenticate it to say they, they admit the will to probate. They look at the will and they see that it's properly executed by under statute. And what happens, unfortunately, way too often in South Florida, they, they deal with contests. 83-year-old man um, has a 30-year-old girlfriend. Well. And the 30-year-old girlfriend takes 83-year-old man to a brand new lawyer that she knows, who's a friend of hers. And all of a sudden, they create a new will. And guess who's getting most of the estate now? Duh. His girlfriend, not his kids. Oh. OK? So now when the will gets, when, when, he, when they go to try and make this will effective, and it gets filed with the court, everybody gets noticed by, as part of the proceeding. And all of a sudden, the kids start a lawsuit saying, wait a minute, that's not what dad meant. Because the last eight wills he did, named us and our children, and she used what's called undue influence to take him to a new lawyer that he didn't know. He was confused, he was old, he was feeble, and she wrongfully convinced him to write a will completely contrary to his prior, all of his prior expressions, and so it, the probate court resolves that kind of dispute. With respect to real estate. Usually how does it end? What's that? Usually, how does it end? Do they make... You just know usually. It, it all depends. It depends on all the facts and circumstances. Okay. Um, you know, it could be, it could be that he, there's a parade of witnesses that showed that the old man was completely with it, that he was still running his business and he had full mental capacity and mm -hmm. knew what he was doing. And you know what? You have the right to do anything you want with your property. Duh. Okay? Now, from a title standpoint, when somebody dies, title to the real estate vests, transfers upon death by operation of law. That means that as of the date that person dies, the next person owns it mm -hmm. automatically. Mm -hmm. However, the purpose of the probate proceeding or the purpose of filing a copy of the trust is to determine of record who, who got it. 
but it still happens automatically. You just have to go through these proceedings. Now, in some situations where it's not the homestead, let's say we're talking about investment property, and the person who died owed money, people can file claims at the estate. And a claim is a, I'm not going, I want to get too deep into the probate proceedings, but they can file a claim in the estate, and they can say that they're owed money, and they can require the person appointed by the court, who's called the personal representative, to sell the property, to have money to pay the claims. If that were the case, then whoever got the money as of the moment of death, uh, got the property as of the moment of death, would be divested, would be conditioned subsequent. Okay? Did I answer you? Okay. It's a, it's a, it, it's a court proceeding. It would establish all of these things, so basically establishing a paper trail as to what happens. So, so like the probate period or like process is going to take some time? Yes. So if you are, like in your case, like the 80-year-old guy dies, and say he lived in this house that those kids grew up in, and to their knowledge, that house was theirs after he died. So the next day that he dies, they go in with the keys they have and try to take the house, and she says, oh no, it's my house. But at some point, like, like who really decides that up until the probate is finished, because that could be weeks or months, but you know, it's the next day that they're both fighting over who actually gets to stay in the house. So like, what kind of, you know, pertains to that context? Well, so what's gonna happen is they're gonna to run to the courthouse, mm -hmm. and somebody is going to get, so each of them is gonna say, I have the right to be appointed personal representative to run the estate. Now in your example, your, your adaptation of the example, the house is treated a little bit differently, because a spouse has rights in the house mm -hmm. under the homestead laws, but let me just carry the argument down. Let's assume it's vacation property and they actually are residents elsewhere. So in that case, you have two competing sides that are running to the courthouse, each claiming that I have the right to be appointed in charge of this property. In the, in the severe case, and this does happen, the court can appoint a neutral third party to act um, just for the purpose of administering the property. Now again, going back to your specific example, it's unusual that the spouse is gonna be thrown out of the house right away, even if, if she has no rights. Hang on, I, I have seen one recently, a client of mine bought a house, and there was a prenuptial agreement, which is what normally happens with the 83-year-old uh, man or 30-year-old girlfriend, is that they enter into some kind of a contract. It happens, I know it sounds funny, but you, I tell you, it's, this is, I can't make this up. This particular thing said that the, the wife had no less than four months to move out of the house. Wow. Okay, so this was an agreement they made. She had no interest in the house. She, she, she waved it off as, you know, because what happens is, to avoid these kind of fights, when you have these, um, these relationships that happen, mm -hmm. you, there's a contract that's entered into prior to the marriage that says, look, uh, you got to sign here that you're not that you're not doing this for money, or as we'd like to say, a nurse for a purse. And true, but you, there's a prenuptial agreement that gets signed off, and they waive rights, or they're granted rights. And sometimes the situation is okay. She can live. She doesn't get to own the house, but she can live in the house for her lifetime, ten years, uh, five years, and we're going to put enough money aside out of the estate to pay for it. There are all kinds of things that go. Ryan, sorry, do you have a question? I was asking about the difference between like a trustee and an executor, and how, how would they interact, and can it be the same person? It can be the same person. A trustee is operating under a trust. Mm -hmm. An executor, we don't use that word because it's sexist. Is it? Yeah. It used to be executor and executrix. Yeah, yeah, now it's called personal representative. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm, I'm not making it up. How's that sexist? It didn't so. sound, I didn't mean to be sexist. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I'm sorry. I had no, absolutely zero idea that was sexist. So the personal representative. Personal representative is appointed to administer the estate under the will. Their, their authority is under the will. Sometimes you can have both. Because what happens, unfortunately, is these people spend thousands of dollars on a fancy estate plan, and then they don't put everything into the trust. So at the end of the day, you find a couple of bank accounts, some stock, maybe even some property that they still own in their own name that, there's, that are, have not been put into the trust. So you create what's called a pour-over will. A pour-over will 
has to be admitted to probate. It's just the same thing. But instead of having the individuals as the beneficiaries, it says everything I own that's not in the trust goes into the trust. Because then it's the trust that administers everything. The problem is, there's still the creditor issues, but even by statute, you can't get away from the creditors by putting it into a trust. Okay? Yes, please. What are the costs of maintaining the trust? Just a trust? Yes. Just tax return. I mean, you have, you have, it, there's a cost to form a trust, to, to create a trust, but that's just legal fees. To actually operate a trust? No, nothing. Okay. Next, deeds. I want to talk about transferring properties. That. Give me one second. I'm going to go back to this. Okay. I'm not sticking to this exactly. But it's just it's a little bit helpful. So, because only because I was going to get into the types of deeds, but maybe I should describe what a deed is anyway. We've talked about title before. We talked about passing title, the clump of dirt, the livery of season, all those good things. But unlike a car title, a deed doesn't get sent to Tallahassee and registered. In some states, that does happen, and that's called the Torrens system, T-O-R-R-E-N-S. A Torrens system is actually a registration of the property, and you may see that here in a minute. Um, it's, it, they actually register the property, and they register all the leads just like a car title. But that's not how it works here. Here, a deed conveys the property or an interest in the property from one party to another. Um, and you'll see what it says on the slide, the deed will determine the exact property estate or interest being conveyed. So that's where we, de we write things like, I'm going to convey, if you, if you just say nothing, if you just say from A to B and to describe the property, it's everything. It's the fee simple title, it's the whole ball of wax. You can also convey to A for life remainder to B, C, and D. You can also convey an undivided one half interest. Uh, you can convey as tenants uh, in common, you can convey joint tenants of right of survivorship, tenancy by the entireties, which by the way, tenancy by the entireties is automatic if the grantees are in fact husband or wife and there's no statement to the contrary. All of these things, all of these estates that are created, whether they're carve outs or the creation of joint tenancies or any other things that are being done to vest the title takes place with a deed. That's why the deed is so important. Oh, wait a minute, slideshow. Sorry. See what I'm doing. Or not doing well. Ah. Thank you. Okay. There we go. Requirements of a deed. This is don't worry too much about this, but obviously deeds have to be in writing. They have to be signed by the grantor. Have to have two witnesses in Florida. Property has to be adequately described. Oh, grantor must have legal capacity. What does that mean? Well, what did you say? I said of age. Of age, and how about of sound mind? Yes, yeah, sound okay. mind. Okay, so in my, in my example before where uh, the 30 year old girlfriend took the old man to the new lawyer, if the old man was like drifting in and out, had dementia. Yeah, perfect example. Maybe he didn't have the mental capacity to make a decision this is what he wanted to do. So maybe he didn't have the legal capacity to execute a deed. Because it's the same concept whether you're executing a will or a deed or any other contract. You have to have the legal capacity. And yes, you made a good example. Age is an incapacity. You have to be 21 to execute a deed to property. Adequately described, legal description. We want, yes? Um, just something I always thought about, like when it kind of can't tell legal capacity, because you can say like, oh, like I was under the influence of like, you know, say like drugs and alcohol. But like, how can you be responsible for someone else's use of like drugs and alcohol? Like, if someone's 
you know, a constant drinker, and they make a deal with me, and then later they get like buyer's remorse or seller's remorse or whatnot, and they say, oh, well, I was drunk when I made that deal. Well, it's kind of like, well, you're drunk all the time, so yeah, <laughs> they do that. Why does that make And then the thing is, how do you get your girlfriend when you're going to get her for the first time? If, you, if you are under the influence of something all the time, yeah. um, and you're just accustomed to functioning that way, mm -hmm. you, it, does, it can absolutely make a difference. And, and, but you, it would be up to the person trying to disavow the transaction to prove that he lacked the capacity to enter into the contract, deed being a contract. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Did the 21 assign a deed? Yes. Yes. But Could be, uh, it might be 18 in Florida. Okay. I think it's 18. It might be 18. Doesn't it have consideration though, or is that something? You're jumping. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I don't know. Absolutely. What, I'm going to show you deeds in a minute, um, but so okay. You have to describe the property. Remember, we talked about legal descriptions, and in order for the deed to be valid, it has to describe what you're conveying. If it doesn't properly describe what you're conveying, it can be defective, and that's all kinds of problems. Um, must express an intent immediately. Well, that's as opposed to a future interest. So if I said, I hereby convey this property to A when a graduates from the master's program. Well, that's not a current, present intention to convey. It's something that has to happen in the future, and it's subject to a condition preceded. Types of rights we've been over, acknowledged. Acknowledged is very similar. That's notarized. And it has to be notarized, acknowledged. Really, there's a difference. And you would, if you look at what the block that the notary would be signing, there are two different things that we see most of the time. One is an acknowledgement, which in simple words says, before me personally appeared A, who, upon, who, who acknowledged before me that he signed the aforementioned instrument. And then it may also say, and who proved that it provided X as identification or was personally known to me. Usually in a real estate closing, if you don't know the person, if it's not a regular client, you're going to ask for a copy of the driver's license, you're going to put it in the file. That way, and you're going to make a notation on the body of the, of the deed in the notary block, and I'll show you the graphics in a minute, all that information. To show, and not, not doesn't have to be the driver's license number, just that show me his driver's license, you'll keep the driver's license in the file. And number eight on this list is actually a little unusual looking, but it's for real. The deed must be delivered by the grantor and accepted by the grantee. Your great aunt decides that she wants to give you the property. So she goes to her lawyer and she has a deed drawn up giving you black acre. And she goes home and she puts the deed in her nightstand. She signed it, but it's, she kept it. She hasn't done anything with it, she hasn't given it to you. It hasn't been delivered, you don't own anything. The fact that she signed a piece of paper and kept it just means that she signed a piece of paper. There has been no actual transfer. Just like the clod of dirt from ancient England, it's got to be handed over to you. And by the way, as weird as this sounds, you as the grantee have to say thank you, not thank you, you have to accept it, you have to take it from her. Why would that, where would that come into play? Well, if, you're having, if, if you owe money on a piece of property to a bank and you don't think you can pay it, you want to give the bank a deed in lieu of foreclosure to avoid a legal process. So you go to your lawyer and you fill out a deed and you cite it, it's all proper, to the bank and you mail it to the bank. You've delivered it. You think you're off your mortgage? No. You don't know why? Because they haven't accepted it. So that's a dual element, it's another element that's necessary. I'm not going to get to this yet. So we talked about the formalities. Oh, other things that, that will wind up on a deed are, of course, the legal description. You're required in Florida to put the address of the grantor and the address of the grantee on the deed. Not the property address, but the respective mailing addresses. And while I don't think it's a legal requirement, 
In most cases, the county wants you to put the property identification number, also known as a tax folio number, on the deed. And that just has a tremendous amount of help when it gets to um, indexing it to make sure that the title is OK. All right, now, I want to talk about the different types of deeds. And for that, I want to show you the deed. So give me one second here to struggle with the, oh, look, different types of deeds. <laughs> <laughs> this is really very, very uh, helpful, but it's not as helpful as seeing the actual document. Okay, that's why I said the book is great background, but it's a little more detailed than you're going to want. Here we go, one second. Are these slides going on canvas? Huh. <laughs> I'll try. You, you actually uploaded so. I saw that. But I'll this is a PowerPoint, it. and I don't know if I can do I'll that. You can. You can. It's a file. Yeah, you can. You can save it and then upload it. Yeah, we can help. The, okay, let me, let me, what's that? <laughs> yeah. And I'm happy to do that, honestly. I want to make this as easy as possible. Um, the problem with the upload is that this is attached to the book. Just download the whole book. What's that? Download the whole book. Uh, you can't. You can get it from this. Oh. The PowerPoint are below. Yeah, you it's below. The no, I don't want the PowerPoint. Oh, I, I have. Oh. I have. Um, I'm trying to get out of the PowerPoint and back into the email where I have all the deeds and such. They'll probably sign out. Type sign yeah, out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's signed you out. Yeah. I think it's signed you out. <laughs> Is that possible? Yeah. Is it there you signed up? Yeah. I don't want to lose this. Bear with me. Sorry, you know, it, it, it's, it's a, a new system for me. For you guys, it's, uh, it's easy. In my office, I know what I'm doing. Is there another name besides Sharklink? Sharklink.nova.edu. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your patience. This is a very simple deed. This is called a warranty deed. A warranty deed is the best quality of deed you can give and get. Okay? And the reason for that is that a warranty deed contains warranties of title, which are warranty of season. I own it. I have the right to convey the property. There are no encumbrances on the property. I will defend the property so that you have quiet enjoyment. And if we find anything wrong, I will do whatever is necessary, further insurances, to um, make sure that your title is good. And you don't see any of those things on here. And the reason you don't see any of those things on here is because down at the bottom where you see grantor does fully warrant the title, this is called a statutory warranty deed. And it's a short form. Instead of having the big paragraph of all the different things that I just said, and I'll, I'll get back to some where I'll show you some of those um, those warranties, and if I don't have them here, I will make sure to give them to you. By statute, by just saying fully warrant, all of those warranties are automatically included in the document. Which brings me to what's immediately above that, the subject to language. The subject to language takes away from the warranties of title. The warranty deed warrants not only what I have now and that I'm giving you, but anything that's happened before me. I warranty that my title is good and I will do whatever's necessary to make it good in your hands, except for the things that are in the subject to language. What you see here in this example 
are covenants, easements, and restrictions of record. It's very generic. Covenants, easements, and restrictions of record. There are other things on there that could be, and I'll go over them in more detail. Matters of plat. Those are, remember we, talk, we keep talking about the plat. Things that appear on the plat. Dedications. Some plats have restrictions on them. Government regulations. Well, existing zoning and government regulations, whether the deed says so or not, you're going to be subject to what the government puts on there. And taxes, and this, this is an old deed. This says, today you would see it say taxes for the year 2019 and subsequent years. And the reason is, you would see that on there because 2018 taxes should be paid by now. They're, they're not finally due until the end of March, but in most conveyances at this time of year, you would absolutely have them paid and you'd see it say that. Other things that you don't see in this one, and I want to go to the special warranty deed because that was a, a more modern form and a little more detail. Okay. Ah, good. All right. So this is this is good for a couple of reasons. The difference between a warranty deed and a special warranty deed is the very last sentence or last line, <coughs> excuse me, above the in witness whereof, where it says, and will defend the same against the lawful claims of all persons arising by, through, or under the grantor and no others. What does that mean? That means that I'm willing to warrant what I have since I bought it or acquired it, but not behind me. That's useful if my seller gave me a special warranty deed, so he only warranted what he had, so I can't go all the way back in the chain. I got it through an estate or a trust. It wasn't given to me with warranties. I don't know what happened before the person passed away. I acquired it in a foreclosure or anything else like that where I didn't get all these rights. So, if you look at that whole paragraph, and this is a good one, <clears throat> this one spells out the covenants. And it's, if you look at where the, the, it starts with the bold and, it says, and the grantor, which is the seller, the person giving the property, covenants with the grantee that the grantor is lawfully seized of the land in fee simple, that the grantor has good right and lawful authority to sell and convey the land, and that the grantor hereby specially warrants, this is meaning buy through and under, well it says so, buy through and under the grantor. So there's your warranties of title, your specific warranties of title. <coughs> you also see, if you go up to the subject to language, like I said, this is a more <coughs> modern deed, more complete actually, these things that are in this subject to paragraph come right out of one of the real estate contracts. It's what, what the parties have agreed in the contract that the title will be subject to. In a larger transaction, the buyer will insist that that subject to be limited to the specific things that are found in the title to the property, which I will get to when we talk about a little bit later this afternoon, when we get to the title commitment and you'll see what actually affects the title to the property. But here they're talking about taxes for 2018 and subsequent years. Let's say this happened last year. Zoning and restrictions, the same basic um, wording. And restrictions, encumbrances, mortgages, and other matters appearing on the plat and are common to the subdivisions. Very unusual encumbrances and mortgages would be on there. This must have been a special case situation because normally a buyer doesn't want to take it subject to encumbrances and mortgages. They want clean title. Other matters appearing on the plat and or common to the subdivision. So things that are common to the subdivision would be there's all kinds of, of easements running through it. There's restrictions that say that your houses have to be a minimum size, that you, um, you can't have livestock on a, on a residential lot, things like that. Those are restrictions that are common to the subdivision or residential um, property. The words you do not want to see in the subject to language and what you do not see here at all are words like conditions, because people will, people will create a deed, and instead of putting something specific like this out of the contract, or something specific out that you would find in the title commitment, they'll put words like conditions, restrictions, limitations, and reservations of record. 
very common and very bad, and I will virtually always object to wording like that. And the reason is this. We talked about a determinable fee simple title, a determinable fee title, where there could be a condition that occurs. For example, uh, I think I used the, the sale of pornography on the property. And that if there was a sale of pornography, that the title would automatically revert back to the seller. That's a condition. You don't know what conditions there are, so you don't want the word conditions to take away from your warranties of title. Restrictions we've talked about, that's usually okay, better to be specific, or you should know what the restrictions are before you accept it. Limitations, another dangerous word, if it's generic, because you don't know. You could use the property for everything but a gas station. Well, that's something that's in the public records. It's a limitation, you don't want it to come away. If you don't know about it, you don't want the seller to take that away from your warranties of title. And reservations. Reservations are, for example, the right to go in and explore and dig for minerals. You don't want that in there as a generic statement. Warranties subject twos. Okay, so that's a special warranty deed. Questions on the difference between special? Yes, no? Hold it then. Formulate it later. Okay, next one. Can somebody with a special warranty deed hold their deed upgraded to a warranty no. deed? No. They can only. These, these, these things are snapshots, not motion pictures. Okay. They, you cannot upgrade. So then they can only. Not grant, even points. So they can only grant a special warranty deed. They should only grant a special warranty deed. They should? Yes, people don't pay attention. So what will happen is it's actually a decent question. So what actually happens is if, you're, if people who are not paying attention transactionally, will agree in a contract to give a general warranty deed or a statutory warranty deed, and they didn't get one. But they're not paying attention, because five years ago, they bought, they bought the, the house from the developer uh, in, a, in a subdivision that was being developed by you know, a big company, and everybody got special warranty deeds, because that's what developers do. In commercial, it's much more common. In residential, you usually see warranty deeds. So they got a special warranty deed, and they don't know it. They don't care. And so the next time around, they get led by the hand by the real estate agent to the title company. The title company puts a warranty deed in front of them. They sign it, and they never think twice about it. And most of the time, nothing happens. And we'll talk about why nothing happens when we get to title. Yes? So how is it then, <coughs> and where would it show up for them to know whether they should be getting a special warranty deed or a warranty deed? Well, what they should, they should be getting? Right. So you're saying that it should be by contract. It, it should be by contract. Yes, I follow that. But if you go to a title company and then you do the search and the title company just puts a warranty deed, how do you really know? You don't. Do you That's why you need a lawyer. The records? That's why you should have a real estate lawyer, not a title company. Gotcha. Sorry. <laughs> Commercial. Um, <laughs> no, it's good to know. That's the truth. Because honestly, and I, title companies have a great function. They work well, and they close. They should only close residential transactions. Let me just back up for a little bit because not everybody in the room works in real estate. A title company is a, is a short word for a title agency. It is a, uh, it's a company that has an agreement with a title insurance underwriter that gives them the authority to close transactions and issue title insurance. Title insurance is something we're going to discuss later after when we get into title, which is going to be very shortly. Um, but they are non-lawyers. So most of the time there are lawyers supervising them. It's a nice way for marketing purposes. Some small law firms or big law firms will have an affiliated title company because it looks better when they're trying to get business from residential real estate agents. They don't, residential real estate agents, as a general rule, shy away from lawyers. They think lawyers are bad for, for closings. Um, it's just, it's, like, it's a natural thing. You know, it's like, uh, I tell you, predators and prey. And, and it's just so, so what the lawyer does is he has a second doorway, and he has a staff in there, and they're operating a title company, and the real estate agents are much more comfortable bringing their people in there. They're not giving legal advice, but they are doing the title exam, they're doing the closing, they're doing all the things that are necessary, but they can't solve the problems. 
and they can't give that defined advice, like, and when I say fine, I mean more technical advice, like the difference between the two kinds of deeds and why it's important. Speaking of deeds, let me get to the quit claim deed. The quit claim deed, <laughs> it's not funny. There's nothing funny about a quit claim deed, you're offending it. <laughs> it, it conveys, it, it is a perfectly valid conveyance of title. There is nothing wrong with it. But what it says is, it, and it says so right there, it says what you're conveying is all the right, title, interest, claim, and demand which the grantor has it into the following described piece of property. We, we had some very notorious uh, people back home. Well, so there's lots of notorious people. But this, this document has no warranties at all. All it says is, as plain as day, whatever I have, I'm giving you. I'm not telling you what I have. I'm not telling you it's good. I'm just giving it to you. This is used in, a, in, in many situations. It's used to clear up things. If you find a, a problem with the title, someone has some residual, you think someone has some residual interest that um, you're not, nobody's really sure, but you know you've got to get it out of them and get it to the next place. This is how you do it. There's a cloud on title. Um, somebody says, okay, there's a probate, and we think maybe some document gave the grandchildren some interest in the property, so we want, in addition to the, the son and daughter, we want the grandchildren to all sign quit claim deeds, just because we think these words in this document gave them something. They don't want to say that, they don't want to make a statement that they have anything, because they really don't have anything, or we don't know that they have anything, but this is a quit claim deed. Just whatever I have, you get. It's used, you could use it to give up a life estate. You could use it to give up mineral rights. You could use it to, for whatever it is, but it's whatever I have, I'm giving. Yes? So how does it help clear defective title? So if a, if, when you determine what the defect is, mm -hmm. okay, let's say I do a deed and I accidentally give you the east 50 feet of the property. Mm -hmm. Just it's a mistake, mm -hmm. okay? But you shouldn't have the east 50 feet. He owns the East 50 feet. He has a cloud in his title. He comes to you, and maybe I didn't even own the East 50 feet. It just got included in the deed. But because it's in the deed, it's muddling up his title. So now we come to you and we say, listen, this was a mistake. We'll show you it's a mistake. We want you to give him his East 50 feet back. You don't want to give me any warranties because you don't really own it. You never really legally got an interest in it. But there's something that you have. or we think there's something that you have. So all you're saying is, if I if I have something, whatever it is I have, I'm giving it. And that's what this does. But it could be nothing. It could be nothing. Which is yes. So if you do a quick claim deed, and then, now that's what I have in my hand, and I go sell the property, what am I giving the other people? Whatever you have. Oh, you should never give more than you get. So then if I unless, have- Unless you, are, you also got the warranty deed, and this was to clear something up. Right, so... But if you all you got was a quick claim deed, that's all you should be giving. Yeah. Right, so then what I've seen with real estate transactions is somebody will go in, a wholesaler, pick up a property, do a quick claim deed, and then when they resell the property, the new buyer has gotten a warranty deed. That's why I just asked what I asked. How does... That falls back onto... Somebody stupid. Who? The person who created the warranty deed and who signed the warranty deed, because the they shouldn't deal. be giving more than they got. They don't have it. So really, in any transaction where in the sales there's been a quick claim deed, it can't jump to a statutory a warranty. It can't deed. jump. I mean, people use it. People do use it. The problem would be if there was ever litigation, you would come in. There are, there are, there, there's title litigation where you have to go back up the chain through the warranties. So what happens something. with them? Can they do title insurance on this? Oh, yeah. It's, if, if, if they do a search and they determine that um, the person signing the deed has what they're supposed to have, it doesn't matter that it's a quick claim deed. It's perfectly valid. The problem, I think this is what you keep alluding to, is the bad people out there mm -hmm. who will come along and say, you know, like next to the popcorn is the deed stamp. And for $500, I'll give you a deed to Blackacre. Oh, wow, I'm going to own real estate. Mm -hmm. And you didn't move, didn't you poop, do? You did nothing. <laughs> or some long, long lost, you know, great grandchild 
Well, through or or worse. Anybody here a junior? So, <laughs> 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 the father's still alive? No. Okay, uh, but when he was, would you have ever signed his name? You know what he to deep? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Honest. here's what happens. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, in dealing with the bad people, we've seen the situation where Junior presents himself with, out, the Junior just happened to fall off of somewhere but presents himself to a title company with his identification to say he's, the name matches the name on the deed, okay? But the, 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 those little two R, the, the JR just kind of, I don't know, it fell off somewhere. Signs the deed, sells dad's property, off to the races with the money. Yeah. It's, it's, it happens. So, same thing, a quick, and it could be a quick call. So it's, you know, it's, it's that's just an example of where someone can take a quit claim deed and use it. Uh, you, could impersonate, you could impersonate an LLC, for example. You could say, I'm the newly elected manager. There's all kinds of fraud that goes on. We're like an episode. So when I, sometimes when you're looking at the property appraisal, you'll see that the sale was like a dollar. And so when you're looking at the property appraisal, okay. how does that happen? All right, so first of all, first of all, on the body of the deed, you're going to see Right, you see the witness? Witness myth there? It says $10 is another good value of consideration. In Florida, we do not put the actual dollar amount on the body of the deed because it's just one more typo that you can have, and it's a bad thing. Some states, you have to have it on there so they can see for imposing the transfer tax. In this case, it's just legal consideration. The time you will see that on the property appraiser's website is when someone has made a transfer what's called nominal consideration. They are reciting, they're only paying the 70 cents in doc stamps because, for example, it could be a family transfer. It could be a transfer into a trust. Uh, it could be a transfer, a gift. And it's also, it's only going to show the $10. That's the reason. If when the transfer tax is properly paid in the sale, the full amount is going to show up. So let me just hit two more deeds before we get to the, to the break. And then I'll come to the No, that's the Hold that one. Hold that one for title. Okay. So did the quick claim deed? No. Did I bring a trustee's deed? There's two other kinds of deeds you might encounter. Not kidding. Special warranty, quick claim deed, warranty deed. No. Okay. All right, so there's two other, two other minor types of what they call specialty deeds. One is a personal representative's deed. This comes out of an estate, and there's two different wait times you're going to see this. One is if the personal representative is actually selling property out of the estate for the purpose of raising money uh, to pay claims or expenses of administration. And the other time you're going to see this is when the personal representative is done administering the estate, and now they're going to actually release their right to um, divest the estate beneficiaries by giving them a deed to the property. There is actually now a, another form that's in use where a personal representative is literally filing a document, not a deed, saying that they're releasing that right. Because the personal representative has the right to divest beneficiaries of the estate, not homestead, for the purposes of paying claims or expenses of administration. So they could take your property back, sell it to pay what's due uh, under the estate. And the last kind of uh, deed that I'm going to talk about is a trustee's deed, which is a deed coming from a trustee. Remember, a trustee, even though the, the typical trust that we've been talking about is the same person, a trustee is actually acting in a representative capacity, not an individual capacity, unless it happens to be the same person. And therefore, a trustee has no authority under the trust agreement to make warranties of title. So a trustee's deed usually will be the same form as a special warranty. OK? Break time. Okay. Take a breath. Blue line. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in a 
contract. Break time. Right? You have that. <laughs> right? Right. So if right now I'm looking at a property, you're going to know it's just done. That's a quick claim deed. And this is my buyer only get a quick claim deed with title insurance. Because I I see it all day long with the work. Yes. I know. Because the title company don't know the difference. And half the lawyers don't pay attention to it. I mean, and I can't. So why is there a quick claim deed on here? Well, because they don't want to do it. Be sure. it's not right, it's not, it's right. right, but I see it so much, in, especially in like a lot of the... Well, okay, because if I, if, if I were representing the buyer, I would I mean, say, wait, well, the contract doesn't provide for it. It doesn't. I want one of these, and I want the one that's appropriate. Right. And if it's not an estate, and it's not a trust, and it's not a guardianship, I want to learn to do it. So, right. Or, if I'm representing the seller, before I let my client sign the property, and you know what happens, because we're going to take on the smaller things to the way. But if I have the opportunity, I'm going to change it. And how do you make that change? Cross it out. Okay. I was really craving that. So then let's see, so I have a statutory custody. You have to claim it over to me. Yeah, and now I'm selling it over to the other guy. Yeah, I can only yeah, offer him a quick claim. Yeah. 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 It's all brand new. I'm just craving it. I don't feel like it's all brand new. Because I see it so much. And now I know. You're not exposing yourself. Okay. You're not exposing yourself. You're not exposing yourself. You're not exposing yourself. Right. So you know there's no consequences. So that's really exposure I'm going to make it. You've got a short time. You know I'll call it to sell it. Oh. I got you. All right, thank you. That's where. But if I see it for a buyer, really push it. Put it in Okay. Pardon? Put it in my island. Thank you. My, um, some of my good friends, like, there are a couple of, there's twins. And and then there's one player, he's my buddy, he's in the NFL, mm -hmm. and I, you know, they all do, and I think they, they go down, they rent, they go mm -hmm. Where? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Like a helicopter pad. Like? Like on, on the cliffs, it's like incredible. here, you know, stuff you can't do. There's just not a notion of that over there. And they just chill out of the water yeah. and just float around. Okay. But like, like, I know it's cheaper, but like, what is like a... No, I gotta spend that like a thousand a night for a Okay, minute. let me take let me take cars for example. Let me start with cars like here how much do you think you would rate range rent like a range over or something? Anywhere from like forty to like nine dollars a day, right? Yeah. And it depends what kind of where you go. Right. But, you know, forty dollars. For what? For a day? Yeah. Yeah. For a big car. That's so, no, so that's for a hotel, it goes the same. What about like a hotel, like a Ritz Carlton stay? Two fifty. That's more. Okay. If you go, is there like Ocho Rios Ritz? Ritz. You would pay your money. Not Ocho Rios. Eggs. What am I saying? Um, what's the name of the city? Okay. If you go, you'll pay four in the money. If I go out for Haitian money. How do you have Haitian money? Like, no, no, whatever Haitian, Haitian price. Why? That's just the way it is in a third world country, my friend. What if, what if they don't know if you're Haitian or not? No, that's another story. That's exactly why a lot of them Is there a secret us. code word? Is there a code word? No. We have a more code word. Yeah, Haitian. Hmm? He has Haitian friends. Hmm. There has to be someone who put them in there. What? Put him into it, like to go there and to get the prices and to where to go and stuff like that. It has to be, he has someone has to just give him. You what's just name, don't get what's the name of the currency. Oh, it's, we don't. It everything is American dollars. You know? We we take American dollars like this or tomorrow. When I go, I eat it with the American money. I don't. Hmm. I don't change it to the normal currency. I only change it if I'm good giving giving it away.